Eh, buenas tardes a todos. Mil gracias a los organizadores por esta invitación. Voy a hablar de dos temas fundamentales. Es un trabajo que hemos venido desarrollando con la banca multilateral, especialmente con el Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo. Pero antes quería mostrarle tres indicadores importantes de Colombia. Eh, Colombia es un país que estamos pasando por un momento histórico, es un, un crecimiento importante en el año pasado de 4.2%, una inflación muy baja del 2.4%, este año vamos a tener una inflación por debajo del 4% y hay una gran credibilidad y aprovecho estos momentos a todos los inversionistas que crean más en Colombia, tenemos una inversión del sector privado casi de 16 mil millones de dólares, eh, una pobreza que hemos venido bajando en los últimos años, teníamos una pobreza de 48%, ahora la tenemos una pobreza del 32%, pero ya tenemos ciudades con índices de pobreza menores del 20%. Nos falta mucho por hacer, pero creemos que el desempleo, que ya está por debajo del 9% este año, vamos a salir rápidamente si hacemos una negociación de paz, porque básicamente lo que estamos buscando con estos programas es reducir la pobreza y generar empleo. ¿Y cómo lo estamos haciendo? Pues básicamente, Findeter es una banca mediana de desarrollo, donde hace dos años, después de un desastre, el fenómeno de la niña, que destruyó más de 100 mil viviendas, afectó más de 400 mil familias, eh, el país se dio cuenta que el cambio climático llegó a Colombia para quedarse. Nosotros no somos grandes generadores de CO2, sino que somos grandes afectados por estar en la línea ecuatorial, de todo lo que sucede en el mundo en el cambio climático. Y por eso creamos una empresa nueva, después de 23 años la repensamos con instrumentos financieros e instrumentos no financieros. Y queremos ser la banca de desarrollo sostenible del país y para eso pues tenemos algunos recursos importantes para financiar los sectores que más afectan a una población. Colombia es un país de ciudades, tiene 62 mil, 62 personas, perdón, 62 ciudades mayores de 100.000 habitantes y creemos nosotros que los sectores que, vamos a, que estamos financiando son sectores como el tema de la movilidad, que afecta enormemente a las poblaciones, el tema de la energía, el tema de la vivienda del desarrollo urbano, el tema de salud y educación. Entonces, en esos dos sectores estamos financiando directamente a los municipios, a los departamentos, y adicionalmente al sector privado. Colombia también es un país ya que tiene el 75% de sus habitantes viviendo en las ciudades. O sea, no hay que esperar 20 años más, ni hay que esperar 10 o 15 años más, ya el 75% de la población vive en las ciudades. ¿Por cuál es la razón? Pues nuestra guerra que lleva más de 60 años en nuestro país, por eso... Lo hemos anunciado donde vamos, que Colombia necesita vivir en paz y por eso desde el gobierno nacional estamos tratando de afirmar la paz con los grupos guerrilleros. Hemos desembolsado en estos programas 4 mil millones de dólares aproximadamente y nos falta por desembolsar 1.400 millones de dólares. Estamos, Colombia son 1.100 municipios, estamos en 316 municipios con 1.800 proyectos sostenibles. Un proyecto para la paz es el proyecto de las 100.000 viviendas. Ahí pueden ver las viviendas que estamos construyendo en todo el territorio nacional, 220 municipios, viviendas dignas, viviendas donde la gente pueda me mejorar su, su hábitat y fundamentalmente son viviendas que están dentro del perímetro urbano, cerca a los centros de transporte, cerca a los centros de trabajo, cerca a los temas de educación y de salud. Una muestra, ahí tenemos cuatro proyectos, no me va a detener por el tiempo y estamos invirtiendo solamente en ese programa 2.200 millones de dólares y Fineter es el banco operador. También el desarrollo debe empezar por A, por agua potable y por eso estamos invirtiendo este año solamente 400 millones de dólares en llevarle y mejorar los servicios públicos a las ciudades donde estas viviendas están construyendo. Pero para focalizar nuestra inversión, hemos logrado y mejorar nuestro, nuestra focalización, una iniciativa que el Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo, el BID, 
había lanzado en Colombia en Latinoamérica hace tres años. Colombia está firmando 14 tratados de libre comercio, Colombia está buscando generar empleo a través de la apertura económica de nuestro país y nosotros adaptamos esta metodología para ciudades sostenibles y competitivas. La sostenibilidad sin generar empleo y sin terminar la pobreza nunca podrá ser competitiva. Y para eso buscamos unas ciudades de las cuales eh, Barranquilla, Manizales, Pereira Bar y Bucaramanga, Pasto, Montería, Cartagena y Valledupar. Me acompañan los alcaldes de Cartagena en este momento, el alcalde de Pasto, el alcalde de Valledupar, igualmente el alcalde de Montería, que, hacen, que participan en la voluntad política de querer desarrollar estas ciudades más habitables. Apoyamos estos desarrollos urbanos que lo bus busca como fundamental en mejorar la calidad de vida y el bienestar de las ciudades. Buscamos un plan de largo plazo. En Colombia los alcaldes no se pueden reelegir inmediatamente. O sea, hay que esperar cuatro años para que se reelijan otros cuatro años. Entonces, lo que estamos buscando es que pensar a largo plazo, el desarrollo urbano debe ser a largo plazo, con acciones de corto plazo. Y es básicamente la plataforma está fundamentada en cuatro ejes. Sostenibilidad ambiental. Ahí vamos, nos dieron en las primeras cuatro ciudades que hicimos el diagnóstico, 850 millones de dólares de inversión. Sostenibilidad urbana, que es todo el componente que está tocando aquí en muchas partes de la feria, sostenibilidad de movilidad, la sostenibilidad de la gestión de riesgos, de servicios públicos, de renovaciones urbanas y todo el tema de vivienda. Como por ejemplo, en este, en este ítem nos dio que una ciudad como Barranquilla, que una ciudad de 2 millones de habitantes, tenemos que reubicar 300 mil familias, 30 mil familias, 30 mil viviendas que se van afectadas por la gestión de riesgo. Bucaramanga, que es una ciudad de 1.100.000 habitantes, tenemos que reubicar aproximadamente 20.000 viviendas, unas ciudades medianas como Manizales y Pereira, entre las dos van a tener 10.000 viviendas. En el tema económico y social, le estamos apostando a la educación, todo el tema de salud, todo el tema de seguridad ciudadana. Y en gobernanza y en el tema fiscal, pues básicamente es fortalecimiento de la capacidad de gestión de las respuestas que el ciudadano necesita que le den las alcaldías. Aquí tenemos un plan, repito, para cuatro ciudades para los próximos 10 años de 2.700 millones de dólares. Por, la, por la, el poco corto tiempo que tengo, pero no me voy a detener en, cada, en todas las ciudades, sino voy a escoger un ejemplo como la ciudad de Barranquilla, que queda en el Mar Caribe. Hacemos encuestas de opinión, esto está respaldado por las cámaras de comercio en cada de las ciudades, la sociedad civil, que está organizada a través de unos de unas ONGs que se llaman los Cómo Vamos, son los encargados de vigilar en el mediano y largo plazo que estos planes de acción eh, se ejecuten. Una ciudad como Barranquilla, el 70% de la gente se puede montar en buen transporte público, pero el 51% no está de acuerdo por la calidad del transporte público. Otro ejemplo es la renovación urbana. Barranquilla no tiene ni un metro cuadrado de zonas verdes. Es una ciudad que... Si lloviera como llovió estos tres días en Barcelona, creo que Barranquilla estuviera inundado. Eh, la meta es tener 5.6 metros cúbicos de zonas verdes, que es la ciudad de Bucaramanga. Necesitaríamos o necesitamos comprar en Barranquilla 750 hectáreas para tener solamente 6 metros cúbicos cuadrados perdón, de zonas verdes. Hace poco tiempo estuvimos invitados por Singapur a Bilbao y tuvimos la, la feliz coincidencia de visitar Ciudad Victoria, donde son 45 metros cuadrados por habitante en zonas verdes. Y hace un mes estuvimos en Singapur y vemos cómo una ciudad bien planificada, bien organizada, tiene unas zonas verdes importantes para que la ciudad sea más habitable. En educación, un ejemplo, nos falta mucho por mejorar la, la calidad de la educación. En cobertura en Colombia tenemos muy buena educación, pero estamos trabajando de la mano de... En países como Inglaterra, Alemania, Francia, España y Estados Unidos para hacer master plan en educación. Y en seguridad ciudadana, pues mucha parte de las negociaciones de la violencia, de los paramilitares que hubo en Colombia y las guerrillas que se están iniciando, pues llegan a las ciudades y se nos está convirtiendo en un problema de orden público. Con tecnología, cámaras, todo el tema de vigilancia y todo el tema de hacer escenarios deportivos 
En este momento se van a hacer más de 220 escenarios deportivos, uno por pequeños municipios, para que la juventud, que en Colombia son 10 millones y medio de jóvenes, pues por lo menos tengan posibilidades de, de hacer deporte. En Barranquilla también hicimos un ejercicio de huella urbana, miramos, miramos hacia atrás 30 años y proyectamos 20 años y lo cruzamos con cambio climático y nos dio ya un ejercicio interesante de dónde se debe construir, cómo se debe construir, cuál es la afectación del río, del mar, de los deslizamientos, del aire y de todo el tema de contaminación. Y ya un minuto para terminar, vamos a iniciar, después de Ciudades Sustenibles, vamos a buscar sus territorios sostenibles y con la Fundación Metrópoli, con la organización Microsoft, hemos desarrollado un diamante en Colombia que es el Diamante Caribe. Este diamante va a conseguir en buscar las fortalezas que tienen ocho departamentos, las fortalezas que tienen nueve áreas metropolitanas y creemos nosotros que podemos desarrollar un territorio competitivo. Son dos acetatos más y termino. Es unir todo el tema de tecnología, como lo están haciendo en esta, en esta feria, con todo el tema de territorio. Es buscar territorios inteligentes. Y básicamente lo que estaba buscando es unir todo el tema, repito, de territorio con tecnología y buscar las fortalezas, que en Colombia tiene muchas fortalezas, pero solamente les va a dar en estos tres acetatos las fortalezas de tener un mar Caribe, de tener una región de 13.4 millones de habitantes, nueve departamentos, esa es la región, la población, seríamos la primera región importante del país, tenemos solamente una región Aeropuertos que movilizan 8, person, 8 millones de personas al año, pero para ir a cualquier ciudad de la costa tenemos que ir a Bogotá. O sea, todos los vuelos van a Bogotá para volver a subir a la costa. Tenemos que bajar una hora para subir una media hora, pero tenemos el mercado interesante de 8 millones de pasajeros. Tenemos puertos. El puerto de Cartagena se está ampliando para 5 millones de contenedores año. El puerto de Santa Marta, 500 mil contenedores y el puerto de Barranquilla, un millón de contenedores. Al y tenemos un río, que es el río Magdalena, donde estamos haciendo inversiones ya por más de 1.500 millones de dólares, a 500 kilómetros de Barranquilla y la licitación de operación del río va a salir, se cierra en el mes de febrero. Y tenemos los cruceros, Cartagena es una hermosa ciudad donde llegan 500.000 turistas en los cruceros, ahí vemos cómo es la influencia, pero también queremos que llegue a Barranquilla, a Santa Marta y al Caribe colombiano. Y fuera de eso tenemos la posibilidad que estamos muy cerca del canal de Panamá y eso va a beneficiar enormemente todo el Caribe colombiano. Barranquilla, Cartagena, Santa Marta y todo el Caribe va a ser de las ciudades más importantes que ustedes van a escuchar en los próximos años en el Caribe colombiano y en América Latina. Si planificamos bien y si unimos este desarrollo de infraestructura con el desarrollo de tecnología, vamos a encontrar que esta región va a ser muy importante para ustedes los europeos para que estén más cerca de mercados tan importantes como el de Norteamérica. Muchas gracias. Muy largo. No morí mucho, ¿no? Larry. Aquí lo está acosando. Once minutos. It's not working. This one is not working.
message? Ah. It's always uh, technical issues, even though now we are really smart cities. <laughs> yes, um, very good afternoon to um, all of you. First, I'd like to thank the organizer for inviting me here to share my presentation, Planning for a Smart and Sustainable City with uh, context from Singapore. Now, I'd like to share with you some of the ideas on the smart growth and the creation of livable and sustainable cities from Singapore's context and from the perspective of a planning authority. First of all, let me start off by introducing Singapore. Uh, Singapore is located in the heart of Southeast Asia. It's a short 13 hours flight from this lovely city of Barcelona, uh, where we are here today. We are fairly similar in um, urban areas and populations. Singapore has 5.4 million, whereas there's 4.8 million people in uh, Barcelona metropolitan uh, region. Now, Singapore is a very young city-state. This year, we are only 48 years old. We started our independence in 1965 as a city with serious problems of unemployment, squatter colonies, overcrowding in the city centre and lack of basic utilities and housing. Over the years, we have grown 3.5, 3.2 times in our population, from 1.65 million in 1965 to our current population of 5.4 million. You can see there, we are so small, you uh, can actually just run across the whole island. From east to west, it's only 43 kilometers, and north to south, only 23 kilometers. However, like many other cities, Singapore also faced many urban challenges. Because Singapore, at the same time, is not just a city. We are also a nation. We are a city-state. So therefore, we not only have to provide for a city, we also have to provide like a nation, for example, on the places, lands for airport, seaport, for the defence and everything that a country has. Now, this important task falls on us, the Urban Redevelopment Authority. We are the National Land Use Planning Authority and the National Conservation Authority in Singapore. So our mission is to make Singapore a great city to live, work and play. And uh, we do this by planning the f and facilitating the physical development and most important, in partnership with the community to create a vibrant, sustainable and distinctive city. So the other question is, what makes city livable? Currently, we all know that cities like Melbourne, Copenhagen, that's where the moderator is from, uh, Vienna, they all recognize as, uh, in one time or another, most livable cities in a number of uh, livability ranking by the EIU, Mon Monocles, and Mercer. Now, Singapore, 48 years later, we are also honored to be regarded as one of the most livable cities in Asia. And um, we are actually quite happy that in 2012, we have been ranked in the uh, most livable city in the world for Asian expatriate. So there are many factors that contributed to this accolade. Of course, the quality of living, which we are ranked 25 out of 221 countries. And uh, definitely for city infrastructure, Singapore is ranked number one worldwide. Now, how do we achieve this? This is really as a result of deliberate, holistic and long-term approach that we have adopted in our planning for Singapore to be a high-density and yet highly livable city. We employ a sustainable development framework to balance the competing needs and to guide us in addressing the challenges which we face during the planning. Now, this framework takes into consideration three key objectives. First, Singapore needs a competitive economy in order to attract investments and to provide jobs. Secondly, the city has to survive with limited natural resources in terms of land and water. But in fact, we do not have any resources. We only have human resources. So therefore, a sustainable environment is very important to us. And thirdly, we have to maintain 
an acceptable quality of life which includes addressing the environment and hygiene problems, as well as providing affordable education, housing and health care. Now, how do we do that? We actually adopt a long-term planning. And to start off, we have what we call a concept plan. The concept plan maps out the long-term development direction for Singapore over the next 40 to 50 years. It is reviewed every 10 years just to keep pace with the changing trends in the economic and social needs. So we take care of comprehensive view of all the land use needs, such as housing, businesses, transport, infrastructure, recreation and community needs, and balances between these different demands for land. So by, by planning long term, we ensure that we have sufficient land for sustainable growth to meet our future needs and that is really one of our key challenge. So from the concept plan, we cascade down to what we call a master plan. The master plan is really a medium term planning. It is a statutory plan, very transparent and it takes care of our developments over the next 15 years. Now it is a, a statutory plan providing land use zoning and also to stipulate the allowable land use as well as intensity for the land. In fact, we have a master plan 2008. If you, you can, it's, it's, it's in one of the application. You want to know about Singapore, you can just download master plan 2008 and you can see all about Singapore. Now, a very important aspect in our planning is engagement of the public and the people sectors. We do this as a whole in what we have a concept called whole of government. Planning can never be done alone by any individual agency. It has to be done in collaboration, both the government agencies as well as the private sectors, the people sectors. So it's very important that we all work together to achieve the common good. So my next question is, before I explain further, let us think about the question, what is smart growth? <clears throat> now, generally, when the discussion and dialogue in the area of urban developments, people tend to associate the term start, uh, smart with the pervasive use of technology and big data in cities. Technology is only one aspect. There are many initiatives underway around the world and each adopts a very different vision and themes of sustainability, livability or efficiency. Now take for example Amsterdam. Amsterdam in the Netherlands strives to be the most environmentally sustainable city in Europe through various initiatives to reduce carbon emissions and has managed to reduce travel and city expenses by adopting a smart work centre model. Mazda Smart City in Abu Dhabi is a planned city which will rely entirely on solar energy and other renewable energy sources with a sustainable zero carbon, zero waste ecology and will be a car-free city. Rio de Janeiro, which was highlighted this morning at the opening. Now, in Brazil, it has an integrated command centre to enable effective planning and response to emergencies and special events as well as more efficient route planning. So, if we delve deeper, the concept of smart growth emerged in the early 90s. It accepts that growth and development will continue to occur and so seek to direct that growth in an intentional, comprehensive way. This means that smart growth values long-term sustainability over a short-term focus. Smart growth principles are directed at developing sustainable communities that are good places to live, to do business, to work and to raise families. It incorporates principles such as encouraging development in existing urbanised area, creating more compact development in non-urbanised area, promoting the proximities of jobs, shopping and services to residential area, what we call commonly known as live work play, providing more transportation options and ensuring access to natural areas. Now, in Singapore, just a bit on the smart strategies. So in Singapore, sensors have been deployed to generate data. We have a large deployment of sensors across many domains to enhance the city operations and to improve the situational awareness. 
So compared to the city of Santander, which received 9 million euro to plant 12,000 sensors in 6 square kilometres of land, Singapore has deployed tens of thousands of sensors all over the island for operational uses such as traffic light timing, weather and availability of car park lots, etc. Singapore is also leveraging on the greater availability of data and more powerful information and communication technology to achieve better land use planning and optimization of infrastructure and facilities and to identify emerging trends and correlations among the various patterns in our urban environment. For example, we are looking at demographic and employment data to gain deeper insight into the distributions and profile of our population and correspondingly, the infrastructure and facilities to support the residential and employment centres. We are also studying the anonymous traffic data, example, taxi movement data and traffic speed data to better understand people's travel patterns and preferences. By relating people's travel patterns with the existing land use, urban planners can better co-locate facilities and services, reduce total travelling time, increase public transport utilisation, reduce car dependency and better anticipate and manage peak loads. We have also incorporated smart technology to our power grid to ensure our electricity infrastructure is ready for the future. In 2013, this year, the C40 and Siemens Inaugural City Climate Leadership Award honoured Singapore for its intelligent transport system, which incorporates a range of smart transportation technology, including one of the world's first electronic road pricing system, the real-time tra traffic information delivered through GPS, through GPS-enabled taxis, and also a highly integrated public transportation system. In fact, my colleague from the Land Transport Authority is here. If you want to know anything about mobility, he is here. He's sitting over at that corner. We have also identified some living laboratories such as the Jurong Lake District to test out the real-time information with a smart application. Now, one of our initiatives which we are working on is sustainable and smart district management through leveraging sensing abilities and fast information dissemination to create greater awareness and enable faster and more preemptive responses to improve the quality of high-rise living and to achieve higher efficiency in town council or building management operations. We are also striving to create seamless and convenient mobility through the increasing the availability of land of and meaningfully integrating information available to commuters, drivers, transport operators and the authorities. We also aim to create a consumer-centric experience by connecting the community with the local events that are taking place via the push of relevant announcement in an integrated manner. Now, a, uh, another example is what we call a smart bus stop, you can see that. This is bus stop which is currently under planning and will be under construction early next year. It is a specific example catered to consumer that uh, working in the Jurong Lake District. Designed as a non-conclusive kit of parts, the bus stop incorporates latest infocom technology to offer civic services like media board, Wi-Fi, phone charging. Everybody owns a smartphone, so convenience to just charge the phone over there, all right? In addition, we also have in place the seamless and pervasive connectivities via wireless at SG. And now we are working towards a connected Singapore. Now, I just want to go on to share a little bit on um, the, what we aspire to be a city in a garden. Okay. <clears throat> Through our land conservation, this you see here, in 1986, our population is 2.7 million, but as we increase 70% in population, our greenery can grow by 11%.
we have set aside 9% of the land for na na nature reserve and parks and 90% of our home within 400 metres of a park or park connectors. So we want to make Singapore a city in the garden. We have been known as a garden city. So these are the new initiatives that we are doing. Attractive new park, building park connectors. So for example, we have this creative process, what we call a park connectors, linking from park to park. So what happened is now we have already had 200 metres of kilometres of park connectors by 2030, we would have completed 360 kilometers. And by then, we would have one known as the Rao Island Route. So next time, this is 150 kilometers. If you come to Singapore, you can truly do a cross-country marathon, three and a half marathon. So these are examples of some of the park connectors. In New York, they have the High Line. In Singapore, we have the Forest Walk. All right? <clears throat> now, in addition, we have this scheme known as the Active, Beautiful and Clean Waters Programme. If you look at this picture there, at the top, you have a, a canal that is very functional. But we have torn down the canal and recreate a river, so to speak. And this is how it looks like, no more a canal. All right? And that's another picture. It's very nice to see how the people are using it. And not only this has been done, besides the usage by the people, it also helped to contain more water so that the water flow can be, can be slowed down, down the streams. Now, another thing that we do a uh, lot more is vertical garden city. Right now, we have what we call a landscaping for urban spaces and high-rise uh, spaces. So this is a concept that we do. We promote a lot of vertical greening in Singapore. Last year, we worked on a published uh, Singapore together with A plus U, claim Singapore as a vertical city for vertical green. Just two weeks ago, we launched a new book called Vertical Garden City. You can get them from our website. So I just want to show some example. For example, residential building. You see residential high-rise building with vertical green. All right. You will see that um, this is a school, school of the arts with vertical greens. You see this a hospital known as a hospital in a garden or garden in a hospital. It helps in the healing power. Green is always very pleasant. This is the latest in uh, Institute of Technical College, it has got three, 5 point, uh, three square meters of vertical green, easily one of the Guinness Book Record of vertical green. Now, if you come to Singapore, this is the latest hotel that's completed. It is Park Royal at Pickering. So it is actually a hotel in the garden, or garden in the hotel, finishing, yes. And in future, we have more green that, that is coming up. All right, so in what we are doing in Singapore is to create Eco town with a lot of green. I just want to quickly show you. These are some of the examples of the pictures that we do. And in Marina Bay, we have created, uh, because of long term planning, we could uh, reclaim 372 meters, hectares, and of which 100 hectares is used for the green, the gardens. And this is what we call gardens by the bay. All right. Now, I just want to quickly wrap up. Uh, next year, we're holding the World City Summit in 2014. All of you are welcome to participate. This is a platform for learning and sharing for all the cities. And we had 100 mayors last year that joined us. At the same time, we also award the Lee Kuan Yew World City Prize, known as the Nobel Prize for City. And all together, under all this long-term planning, we work towards a smart and sustainable city. Thank you. Sorry. It's okay. I'm, oh, I'm supposed to see you. Very good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Hola, hello, good afternoon. Uh, 
My name's Ross Hudson. I work uh, in London for the Greater London Authority, which is the uh, civil service, uh, the strategic authority for London uh, under the Mayor of London. Now, I work in a new division uh, which covers development, enterprise, so innovation, technology policy, uh, and environment. So we're trying to bring various things together to uh, help design um, uh, an emerging mega city in London. Um, I work on our Smart London program, which is a new program, um, which is being uh, designed to uh, bring together the existing smart city innovations that are happening in the city, uh, to bring together the activity that we're initiating or the mayor is initiating, um, and to try and do some new and exciting things that, uh, that are going to work for London. Um, so Europe's obviously not a mega city yet, but it's going to be one. It will be Europe's first mega city by 2030. There are currently 8 million people in London. Um, we're in the process of building 50,000 new homes each year. Um, now, unlike some other cities, um, oops, excuse me. Unlike some other cities, London can't just continue to expand. It can't continue to grow outwards. We have to grow within our own footprint. That means greater densification. It means redesign. It also means building on top of the old city. Um, that presents challenges. We've already got fairly congested roads in London, as I'm sure you're aware. Uh, a fairly congested uh, metro system. We've got fairly congested and, in some cases, very old utilities. London's, some of London's water infrastructure dates back to 150 plus years. We've got the oldest um, sewerage system in, in, in the world, but not to worry, we are reinvesting. Uh, there's something called the Thames T Tideway Tunnel, which is a 12 to 15 billion pound project um, uh, to uh, redesign the sewerage system in London. Um, and like other cities, we've got uh, CO2 to deal with and we've got local air quality issues to deal with. We also in London have fairly complex governance structure. Uh, we have the mayor, but we also have um, 33 local authorities. So what we're trying to do is much what Singapore and other global cities are trying to do, is to grow sustainably without expanding. Um, and smart, you know, digital information uh, driven, technology driven solutions, essentially can help us to do that. And that's, that's really where stuff is, th th this stuff is positioned in London. So we want to use the creative power of new technology to serve London and improve the lives of Londoners. Um, and we're trying to do two things. We're trying to deliver for London through collaboration. Um, so um, that's to deliver resilience, efficiency, sustainability, quality of life. But we're also trying to understand what London's assets are to support growth, to create jobs, to create inward investment, uh, particularly in um, smart services, and uh, we think we've got areas where we've got particularly USP or at least particular strengths. So where our Smart London program is concentrating at the moment is where these two areas overlap. And I'm going to talk a minute in, a, in a minute about uh, some of our transport and digital initi initiatives because that's an area where we've got particular strengths. Um, yeah, so as I say, we've got some quite significant cap capabilities in this area in London. Uh, we've set up a, a Smart London board, uh, which brings together uh, academics, um, some of the uh, larger tech companies that, that are making investments in London, but also some of the SMEs, uh, and has citizen representation as well. Um, and that's really helping us to align our capabilities. So we have, as you probably know, two universities uh, in the global top 10. Uh, one of the highest, if not the highest, concentration of digital creative firms and strong IT base as well. Uh, and we have um, Tech City, which is uh, an area of Shoreditch um, in, in, in central London, uh, which has a uh, very high density of uh, what you would call smart city businesses. Tech innovators, data scientists, working together uh, to, to deliver um, some of the solutions for London. And we hope that some of those are exportable. Um, You've probably all been to London, and, and you probably just see it as one city, but London really is, is many cities in one. It's evolved over centuries. Uh, there are 200 urban centres. 
we've identified over 600 different types of communities. There are 45 major regeneration areas in London at the moment, of which the Olympic Park and the surrounding area is probably the most famous. And there's a list of some of the other ones there. These are some of the biggest regeneration projects in Europe. Why are they important? Because they provide the opportunity to do things differently. They provide the opportunity to integrate digital innovations into the design process. They allow interaction between digital innovation and urban planning and infrastructure planning. Um, and what we're trying to do is bring together some existing initiatives that we've already had in place uh, with some new demonstrator projects bring them together in some of these large regeneration areas um, to test new ideas, to test new solutions. Um, although you can't really see the, the, the details of this map, this is an area called Elephant and Castle, which is a central London area, um, uh, already very high density, uh, very badly designed in terms of urban planning. Uh, it's got two major roundabouts. The connectivity is very poor. Um, but it's an area where there's huge new investment coming in. So we're using this as an opportunity to bring together some of the um, uh, digital innovations, the smart innovations, with some of the major infrastructure investments that are happening. Um, so to just give you a, a, a quick idea on what some of those are in, 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 the, in, the, um, in the world of sustainable urban mobility. Um, so at the top left here, so, sorry, it's slightly difficult to see, uh, we've got a large demonstrator of what we call a cooperative systems. Um, so Larry mentioned some of the um, uh, route planning work that they've been doing in Singapore. We've got some uh, similar stuff in London where we're taking data feeds from across the city, um, particularly piloting the, some of this activity on, on, on the major route networks that flow through Elephant and Castle and into the city. So we've got CCTV, extensive CCTV, um, surveillance camera uh, usage there. Um, we're taking feeds from uh, mobile devices. Um, we're looking at integrated master planning of uh, and, and intermodal master planning of the new interchange in Elephant Castle. Um, we're also looking at freight, uh, movements of goods and services throughout the city. So London already has, I think, uh, one of the highest rates of e-commerce in the world. That's all good, that's fantastic. But what it's doing is creating more small deliveries and as people get stuff delivered to their offices as opposed to their homes, that pulls activity into the centre of town uh, and into the middle of the day. That's not something that we really want. And now we can regulate um, uh, to try and uh, shift some of that activity and decarbonise it. So we already have a congestion charge zone, as you know. We're also uh, building on that to make that an ultra-low emission zone. That's fine, but it's a bit clunky. Um, and it doesn't necessarily really work for some of these delivery companies that need to get uh, parcels to where they need to get to. So what we're also doing is creating an information uh, marketplace for these companies so that can, they can collaborate better with each other, but also that they can collaborate better with the end user so that we can start shifting delivery activity out of the center and off peak. Um, yeah, and as you probably know, we've already got a, um, uh, a contactless um, payment system uh, for the underground. We're looking at the next uh, evolution of that, so you don't even need a, a, an Oyster card at all. Uh, you'll just be able to tap in with, uh, with your device. Um, all of these projects are happening. They're underway. What we're trying to do in these large regeneration areas is bring them together and make them greater than the sum of their parts. Uh, just very quickly, um, some of the other activity that we've got going on. Uh, we have already in place what's called the London Data Store, which is one of the first and biggest open data platforms. Um, we're working on a European uh, supported project at the moment to make that what we feel will be the best uh, open data platform in the world. Uh, that's already got huge amounts of public data on it, transport data on it. Uh, we are beginning to work with some of the utilities companies to um, uh, bring in some of their data and some of the large corporates uh, and financial institutions to see what data can be put on there as well. Um, so we're working through some of those data protocol challenges. Um, we've also got some great innovative institutions in London. Intel have just made a major investment at uh, University College London and Imperial College in a smart and sustainable cities lab. We have um, uh, the new uh, 
Future Cities Catapult Centre uh, in London, which is um, a new uh, uh, interdisciplinary collaborative space, um, which is uh, designed to uh, bring together uh, the innov innovators in London uh, to export London capabilities overseas, but also to help us design uh, solutions for London and to create some great visualizations. Um, I'll stop there. Um, if you want to ask me any questions afterwards, I'm happy to, happy to do that. Buenos días, señoras y, y señores. Eh, mi nombre es eh, Nobuya Suzuki. Eh, <coughs> I'm, eh, I'm a deputy mayor of uh, Yokohama. I'm very pleased uh, to be here. Eh, so let me talk a little bit about what Yokohama thinks being a smart city means. We think a uh, smart city is created, not only smart inf infrastructure, uh, but a community everyone wants to live in, and where e everybody is full of vitality through unified efforts among the citizens, industry, and city administration. Let me start by expre uh, explaining how Yokohama has been working to build a sustainable city. Yokohama is a beautiful harbor city, 20 kilometers south of York, uh, Tokyo. Oh. No. Okay. Uh, when it's uh, put open to the world 154 years ago, it was a small fishing village. It has grown to become Japan's second largest city with a population of 3.7 million. This is Yokohama in the 1960s. Water and air were polluted. Waste was being illegally dumped. Uh, road traffic and use of public lands were also problems. Yokohama has striven uh, to solve these problems through the development of infrastructure, what we call our six major projects. The six major projects, projects involved strengthening of the urban core, Reclamation of insure land where factories can be relocated, construction of a new town and expressways, subways, and a huge bridge. The left picture is from 1967, a meeting with the mayor and 10,000 citizens. Through a series of these kinds of dialogues, citizens' voices were heard and their wishes were reflected in city administration. In the right picture, the city met with in industries whose activities adversely affected the environment and concluded pollution prevention agreements with them. In this way, industry and the, the administration tackled the pollution issue together. Citizens, industry, and the administration worked as one on a variety of problems with the aim of make, making Yokohama a sustainable city. Today, it ranks at the top in Japan of places where people want to live and the people who are living there are happy. Now, however, Yokohama is facing new challenges. These include promotion of a low-carbon society, economic growth in a matured city, and meeting the needs of a super-aging population. Each is important and urgent, and city must work on them with 
concerted effort. We think of this in terms of three aspects, a recycling society toward becoming self-sufficient, a sharing society in various interesting respects, and a creative society that creates new value. As always, citizens, industry, and the administration apply themselves together. I will explain recyc a recycling society first. In a recyc recycling society, waste is a major focus. Yokohama, with its citizens, la launched its G30 plan to reduce waste emissions by 30%. It was a nine-year project starting in <clears throat> 2002, but the goal was achieved in only three years uh, due to diligent efforts by the citizens to separate their waste. As a result, about $1 billion was saved, originally intended to build and operate new in incinerators. Remaining waste Waste not uh, eliminated by these efforts is burned to gener uh, generate electricity, supplying about, about 20,000 households. The pic uh, picture at the upper left is the in incineration plant. At the, the right is, upper right is a plant to generate electricity using slush uh, from storage treatment. Other major renew, uh, renewable uh, energies adopted by the public sector in Yokohama include solar power generation at some 250 elementary and junior high schools, wind power, and small hydroelectric generation units. Yokohama also prom promotes recycling activities for greening the city. Yokohama carries out various activities roughly divided into the three areas of protection of forest, protection of agricultural fields, and making green. <clears throat> to support those activities, the city asks uh, its citizens and industries to pay a green up tax. Next, uh, let me talk about a sharing society. In addition to uh, public transportation, such as trains and buses, Yokohama promotes mo uh, mobility sharing for a variety of individual needs, helping both cit citizens and tourists to move around the city easily and comfortably. For example, in addition to rental bicycles, we have micro-EV. Uh, micro-EV allows the sharing of a new type of ultra-compact EV. Uh, next, we have energy sharing. As it introduces a new, a new, uh, new uh, re uh, renewable uh, energies, uh, as explained previously, the city's smart grid project makes it possible to properly manage and distribute it, the uh, gener generated electricity. Uh, 35 private sector industries work together with citizens and the city, uh, city administration on various energy management projects. Uh, by linking EV projects uh, to energy management at homes, offices, and factories, we strive for efficient use of uh, energy th throughout the city. Uh, next, uh, let's look at individual homes. Uh, combined with uh, a solar power generation system, uh, power consumption is visualized by ICT to achieve more effective use of the electricity. Uh, by the visualizing use of electricity, consumption has been cut by about 10%, also reducing CO2 emissions. And in consumer uh, tests, where users were further asked to cooperate to control their use of electricity uh, in order to share a limited supply, uh, they adjusted their demand and consumption of electric power was cut by as much as 50, uh, 15%. 
Uh, next, let me explain what we mean by a creative city creating new value. Uh, being a smart city means more than smartness in the safety and security of infrastructure. It is also necessary to be a city that is attractive and feel, uh, fulfilling while maintain, maintaining appreciation for its traditions. For example, a smart illumination using uh, LEDs and FabLab uh, activities are promoted by citizens on their own initiative. Uh, I have been describing smart cities in terms of the three as aspects of recycling, sharing, and creativity. In the actu uh, actual activities, the perspectives of citizens uh, living there and the nature of the communities are, of course, important. I think uh, these uh, will be key points uh, hereafter. Advocating creation of next generation suburban, uh, communities, suburban communities uh, and with the slogan creating communities together, uh, residents, uh, the administration, universities and industri in industry work together to create next generation communities. Uh, as I have uh, emphasized, uh, when creating a smart city, although the entire picture of the city is considered, those living in each livelihood zone understand its characteristics the best. The various parties uh, involved consider together the kind of a place they want to live in and they work to realize it. Re realize it. Uh, together they build uh, communities full of vi vitality where everyone wants to live. The result is a, a, sub a sustainable smart city. Yokohama is determined to continue its, uh, its smart city activities and to be worthy of winning the best, first best smart city prize in the world's smart cities hours here. As always, I will do our best. Gracias. Thank you, please. I will now invite uh, the four speakers to join me uh, on stage for a round of discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you for very uh, exciting presentations. Uh, I'll, I'll start with one question, uh, which uh, I'd like uh, you to answer. And, uh, and my question is about, you described some very uh, ambitious and uh, uh, visions for, for, for development, both at the regional level, but also at the city level. And uh, my question is about how have you worked uh, towards making, uh, ensuring that the various actors which are uh, involved in delivering on that vision, how have they uh, uh, established ownership or uh, taken that vision and being able to subscribe to that in the, in, in, in the process? I'd like to start with Larry. Could you say something about that in, ah. in relation to the, uh, for instance, the uh, Lush project or the, uh, uh, that, you know, how have you worked with different departments in the administration to yes. deliver on that? Yes, um, thank you. Um, to us, as I said earlier on, that planning, it is not to be done by a single agency. Although it's a government function, government cannot do it alone because ultimately you're planning for the people. So what we have, we're lucky, we instituted this whole of government approach meaning to say we engage all the government agencies that are related because for planning, it's a matter of trade-off, especially for us, so land constrained. If we gave a land to somebody else, another one will not be able to do it. It's, it's a trade-off. So we have a master planning committee where all will come together and so there's a lot of a trade-off to some extent. But more importantly, you have to make sure that you engage the private sectors. The developers, the professionals, must be on board together with you because they are the one that will ultimately construct the building all right to we plan but they construct for example they will have to do the uh, 
the uh, gardens, vertical gardens for the hotel because it costs a little bit more, but they know their benefits. And not only that, we engage the community. We must make sure the communities buy into our plan. So for every concept plan and master plan, we will have big focus group engagement. We make sure that all our citizens uh, get to hear about it and they will give us the feedback. We will take in all the feedback and refine it. So ultimately, the plan will be a refined plan, taking into consideration as many as possible. Some of you may have heard, in the beginning of this year, we have what we call a population, huge population debate. We are looking at, by 2030, a population of 6.9 million. Not that we have 6.9 million by then, but the whole idea is to make sure that you provide for future growth, so that by 2030, you have facilities you have the plan to make sure you can accommodate 6.9 million. So that conversation is called the Singapore conversation. We engage the whole entire levels of Singapore. So that's how we, we work in collaboration with and in partnership with the community. <coughs> Thank you very much, Larry. Uh, Ross, I'd like to ask you, in, in relation to the uh, demonstrator projects that you described, how have you, again, engaged the uh, local communities on that? How did you make the, the benefits of these projects tangible for them and other actors which were also involved in delivering on these projects? Well, the process actually is, is, is very similar to the one that Larry described there. I don't think we do actually do anything dramatically different in London from, from the way things are done in Singapore, um, except that possibly the governance structures in Singapore, in uh, London, are, are, are a bit more complicated. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whether it comes to individual projects or the strategic or master planning of a particular area, um, sometimes that's done by us, sometimes it's done by uh, the authority more local to that area. But the processes for uh, community engagement are very, very similar. You know, um, there are mechanisms to go out uh, and meet and greet people um, and to elicit responses from them. One thing that we've got in London um, is something called Talk London, uh, which is a, a, an online communication tool to, um, directly from the mayor to, to citizens of London, whereby um, either on um, major policy issues or on specific project opportunities, there's, there's a means to communicate directly with the mayor. Now that works reasonably well, but people are busy and the amount of input that we get to that isn't where it could be. So we've got a, a, a job in hand to really make that uh, a, a much more uh, meaningful means of participation in decision making. How do you deal with the conflicting uh, views and kind of knocking my, not in my backyard uh, attitudes towards uh, transformation projects or yeah. densification projects? Yeah. Um, uh, in, a fair, in a very fair and transparent <laughs> way, of course. Um, well, we have something called the London Plan, which is a strategic plan, um, and uh, you know, it, it, it describes the kind of development that we want to see in London uh, over the period to 2030. Um, beneath that, um, local authorities put their own uh, plans together for these major regeneration areas. Um, uh, and it's their job to engage with the various stakeholders in, uh, in those areas. Um, yes, not in my, my backyard happens, uh, of course. I think it happens less in London, actually, than it does in, in some other places. There's, there's a greater willingness and appetite uh, on the part of citizens and businesses in London to, to adapt to new ways of doing things. And what you see in London is not necessarily the clean sweep away of what was there before, um, but the careful design of new systems, new infrastructures, new buildings alongside uh, the existing city. And that's, that's the approach that we try to take. Thank you. Luis, uh, you, you were describing the uh, Colombia Diamante, the Colombia vision, and, and that's a vision at the regional level where different cities have to engage and subscribe to that vision. Can you say a bit about that, that process and what have kind of tools, mechanisms or processes have you engaged in to make sure that uh, the involved cities bought into that vision and keep on working towards the same vision? Sí, la, la idea nace es porque tenemos más de 10 ciudades trabajando en una plataforma 
de visión de largo plazo de ciudades sostenibles y competitivas. Esta plataforma nos da muchos déficits, déficit de vivienda, déficit de movilidad, transporte público, todos los déficits que puede tener un país joven como Colombia que cumplió 200 años. Pero también vemos, encontramos muchas oportunidades y con el doctor Alfonso Vegara, con el doctor Rafael de Microsoft, empezamos a mirar cómo integramos esas fortalezas y la primera fortaleza que teníamos era el río, el río Magdalena. Que si cogíamos los 800 kilómetros al final, encontramos capitales de estado, de departamento, de provincia, muy fuertes, desde las Santanderes que sacaba petróleo, eh, carbón, todo el tema de los puertos, aeropuertos, y logramos que hubiera voluntad política de los nueve gobernadores, los nueve alcaldes, capitales de departamento, y estamos iniciando ya unos diálogos ciudadanos para poder identificar cuáles van a ser esas oportunidades complementarias en cada una de las regiones. Y utilizando la tecnología, creemos nosotros que la inversión que ha hecho el país es muy grande en fibra óptica en los últimos años, en el tema de mejorar también los canales de comunicación de ciudadanos eh, con el Ministerio de las Tecnologías. Pensamos nosotros que vamos a identificar proyectos, 99 proyectos se van a identificar, complementarios con los proyectos de tecnología y ciudad inteligente y un territorio inteligente que podamos mejorar. Básicamente el foco es competitividad y generación de empleo. O sea que la, no es fácil la articulación de nueve provincias, nueve capitales de departamento, el gobierno nacional, pero en la provincia nos hemos unido fácil. Lo complicado es unir los, los ministerios a nivel nacional, porque el Ministerio de Transporte, el Ministerio de la Vivienda, el Ministerio de Medio Ambiente, el Ministerio de Minas y Energía, el Ministerio del Interior. Entonces, el, 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 el éxito es la articulación que podemos desde Fineter eh, organizar la política pública y bajarla a un territorio inteligente. Y la gran ventaja es que tenemos para Colombia un poquito de plata. O sea, le podemos dar créditos subsidiados para estas áreas sostenibles eh, a largo plazo, 15, 20 años, con 3 años de gracia, para desarrollar los proyectos que complementen la competitividad en ese territorio. Muchas gracias. Mr. Suzuki, you are a politician, and uh, I'd like to ask you the visions you presented for a sharing society, recycling society, and creative society. How have you uh, ensured like, the political ownership to those visions, even if there is a change in the, uh, in the uh, a, new, a, new, a new administration is, 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 is um, coming to place, or is... So, sorry, sorry. Is that... I can't hear. No Japanese. Would you... Are do we have a translator there, Are please? So my question is, how do you ensure the political continuity of the visions you presented? After that, I will open the, uh, for questions from, from the, uh, the audience. So if you have any questions, think about that. Uh, we'll come to you in a minute. Sorry, uh, uh, sorry. I, I speak in uh, Japanese. Sustainable na machizukuri ということですが、先ほど私が説明をさせていただいた横浜の長い歴史の中で共通すること、これがやはりその市民の力ということです。で、これは日本の中いろんな都市ありますけれども、特にですね。え、国の方からもやはり高く評価をしてされているところで、やはりいろんな都市の課題というものをですね、市民の人たちと企業、行政が一緒になって考えていくと。で、その将来のその問題というもの、その将来のありようというものを一緒になって議論しながら固めていくと。で、そうすれば市民の方々というも同じ意識に立てま立てますから、一緒に同じ行動が取れるということですよね。で、特にその。地域の方々がその地域を愛することができれば、えー、自らが主体的に考えて行動ができるということにもなるわけです。でそういう中で行政が
、えー、市民、えー、企業の,、えー、その力というものをどういうふうに引き出しながら主体的な行動をどういうふうにそのサポートしていくのか。Most, <coughs> the most important for government is working with citizens because、uh, most things are, are working with citizens is the、uh, most important thing. Is, <laughs>、yeah. uh, and also、uh, because、uh, we are not only, you know,、uh, the government is not only one people, I mean, working with lots of state government,、uh, state stakeholders, but uh, uh, working with citizens makes citizens vital. And also,、uh, it would be the、uh, it would be the culture for、uh, students. So it would be、uh, one of the、uh, would be the sustainable for because、uh, people do own、uh, willings. The,、oh. You'll be able to explore further in a one to one conversation with Ms. Suzuki. Any questions, please? We're also running out of time, but we have a couple of time for a couple of questions. No? Okay. We're a bit over time, so I'll just say thank you very much to, to our four speakers. Let's give them a hand.